Thank you for tuning in to the Hope, Strength, Courage podcast. Love and support for parents whose kids are fighting for their lives. A weekly podcast created to support parents and caregivers of children diagnosed with cancer, where you will find resources collected to help you face each day with hope, strength, and courage. From interviews with the top experts in their fields, doctors, psychologists, chaplains, and inspiring frontline workers in pediatric oncology as they share their best advice, as well as day-to-day advice collected from other cancer moms and leaders in personal growth and development. From individuals who understand how hard it can be, I hope you will feel better prepared to cope with the day-to-day challenges of caring for your child. Hi, I am Laura Lane, and I am your host. My own daughter, Celeste, was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 12. In 2015, I wrote about our experiences in the book, Two Mothers, One Prayer, Facing Your Child's Cancer with Hope, Strength, and Courage. Since that time, I have dedicated thousands of hours to share with other parents and caregivers the resources, tools, tips, and skills and strategies I learned that helped our family stay happier, healthier, and more hopeful. My goal is to share with you my interviews with experts to support you as you care for a child with cancer. Today's episode features part one of my interview with NLP practitioners, Jackie Nagy and Ed Oliveira. Last week, we spoke with Kevin Hall, best-selling author of Aspire, as he shared the deep insights he learned when his own daughter, Summer, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. He talked about how he and his family only wanted positive people surrounding her as she went through her treatment and recovery. This is also a big part of the discussion we had during this week's interview with NLP practitioners Jackie Nagy and Ed Oliveira as we discuss how to use NLP and breathing to manage daily stress. I hope you will enjoy this interview as much as I did. I am pleased to formally introduce you to Edward Oliveira and Jackie Nagy. Edward has been working in behavioral health, social work, and the life coaching field for the past four decades. He met John Grinder in 1983 with an initial training in the patterns of hypnosis and the genius of Dr. Milton Erickson. In 1989, he was introduced to the new code NLP in a residential practitioner training in Syracuse, California and later participated in trainer trainings and coacher certifications. He has worked in a wide array of settings, including schools, wilderness programs, hospitals, social services, outpatient clinics, and private practice. In 2016, Edward launched a life coaching practice, Choice Inspirations, a service to help you become your best you. Jackie Nagy is the Be Yourself Coach, She's a professional speaker and member of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, CAPS Manitoba, a certified new coach, neuro-linguistic programmer, master and trainer, adult educator, and coach. Jackie shares the how-to practice tools so people can gracefully coach themselves under pressure. Jackie is the owner of Holistic Directions Incorporated, offering live NLP certification trainings to give individuals, coaches, leaders, and parents the life-changing skills that no one ever shows you to live a more happy and authentic life. Jackie's mission is to flip the model of teaching the theoretical what and why in the field of self-development into teaching the practical how-to skills so that families can live more healthier, holistic, and autonomous lives. Thank you so much, Edward and Jackie, for joining me today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm just delighted to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you, and I'm so thrilled to learn about NLP. Um, It's not something that I know an awful lot about, and and I'm sure our audience is in the same situation. So would you, each of you, share with me what led you to the field of NLP? Um, Jackie, would you begin first? Sure. I um, I have to think back a little bit about that. I was introduced to NLP in my corporate career, and I soon learned how powerful uh, one of the patterns within the field was in my sales position. And I kind of just tucked it away and forgot about it. And then I reached a point in my life where it was, I guess, um, a cross 
roads, if you will, where I had an opportunity to do something completely different. And I was not in a very good space. So my career was shot, my personal life wasn't doing well, my health was really poor. And um, I thought, well, this is an opportunity to do something new and something different. After I got myself back physically in good health, I started to look for what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I remembered that workshop in NLP that I took. And I started doing some research, and I discovered that this was possibly a field of study that I wanted to really dive into. It was at, a, I guess, a, a pivotal point of my life that if I was going to do anything different, now was that was the time. And I was around 50. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that first eight-day training course of NLP was the most profoundly life-changing experience I had ever been on. And I had been on a lot of training courses through my corporate career. And it was at that moment that I decided that that was what I wanted to do for them. I wanted to become a trainer of NLP. The practices that I learned there were, for me, what had always been missing in my life. I started on a field of self-discovery when I was in my teens. I had a fairly traumatic childhood and a lot of challenges being a single mom. And I just never found the how to. There's a lot of people telling me what to do. Uh, or why I need to do it, and I never had found the steps of how, but how, you know? Yeah. And when I got that, I thought, oh, this is it. This is, I'm so passionate about uh, taking these skills that have worked so well for me out to the world and bringing it back to my uh, community. That's what get, got things started, so that was in 2008, and uh, since then, it's been uh, quite a journey. Well, that's terrific. And how about you, Edward? What what brought you into the field of NLP? What what was the catalyst that changed your life? Well, at the time, uh, I was this way. I approached it uh, from a career professional development standpoint, and uh, NLP was coming of age, sort of in that era where it became known that what they were doing was highly effective and very, very powerful and quick for results. And so that really was an interest to me. I also had an interest in hypnosis, which uh, John and Richard, the co-developers of NLP, had modeled Milton Erickson. And he was an absolute genius in terms of getting results. And uh, it was his focus was how you know really what the essence of NLP is how do we get people to help them shift in very rapid ways and so his entire career was based on that utilizing hypnosis and what later became the field of brief therapy was really based on his work so that was my initial um, interest in then uh, attending a, a seminar with John and he's very compelling in his presentation style and very great uh, teacher so that sort of began the journey for me. Oh that's terrific. So still need to know a little bit about what NLP is so I'm going to start with you Jackie if you could really just describe what NLP is and then Edward if you have anything to add in that would be great. Jackie mm -hmm. how, how would well, you? First of all I want to thank you for asking this question and I hope I can do the listeners um, provide a clear answer. I would say that if you ask that question to just about anyone on the planet who's been through some NLP training and had the experience, they would probably answer it differently. Okay. So that's one thing I want to frame my answer on, is really my, my understanding of NLP through my own personal experience and through observing others. Uh, and I'll answer it quickly two ways. On a very high level, which is what John and Richard's initial intention was, it's a set of, um, it's a modeling uh, method for achieving excellence in whatever field of life a person is wanting. So you can take that into any context, whether it's relationships, communication styles, uh, sales, uh, leadership training, um, personal matters, intra inter communication, uh, you know, people that get stuck in limiting beliefs or, um, um, you know, per, uh, tra you know, dealing with tra traumatic PTSD. That is the subset of the modeling are the sets of patterns, the step-by-step -step 
how to patterns that then lead to achieving a different result, as Edward has pointed out. Um, so it's kind of twofold. It's the modeling aspect. So if we're observing somebody else who is doing what we want to do, NLP is the set of patterns that will get you to do what they're doing. And, um, and then it's a set of tools that you can take away and use um, to achieve whatever results that you're wanting as well. Okay. And Edward, what, what do you think? Does that make sense? Say that again? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's it's starting. It's starting to make sense. Yeah. So, Edward, what, is there anything you can add to that? Well, uh, I completely agree. It was it was based on modeling, which you can think of as a child who models their parent. Um, that's the essence of modeling in its very simple uh, simplest terms. Um, in in the late eighties, though, this is the development of new code, okay. and this was sort of, it was a fairly significant shift in how we go about creating the conditions for someone to make changes. And so new code comes with a shift to from conscious uh, um, emphasis to an unconscious emphasis, uh, utilizing games that are designed to kind of engage uh, both hemispheres, all our sensory systems, to create some rhythm as a part of it. And this is, you know, in a video presentation, will be difficult for people to get a true sense of this. Um, that uh, it's actually the experience of the game itself where the power lies for helping make the shifts. And it's uh, very, it's fun and uh, and and uh, fairly rapid and quick to uh, get through. So, so uh, that's new code. Okay, so I'm gonna. I ask you the question. I'm going to throw this at you. That can you give me an example of where specifically NLP would be used? Give me an example, maybe of a client that you know of, or that someone that they have a problem and how NLP helps them. What what specifically are you doing? Oh, uh, I could probably give about a thousand. Okay, I'm going to go with what just came to mind as I tend to go with what my unconscious presents me. Mm -hmm. And what came to mind was a recent, uh, a woman who was on a recent NLP practitioner training. So this is the full eight day training course, certification training. And she had been um, really feeling stuck in her life. She had had quite a lot of traumatic experiences earlier on and that she started to work through on the training as I mentioned earlier. We got about day six, and she uh, decided that she was going to really dive into a dream she had at an earlier stage of her life where she wanted to write. Okay. She didn't know how or what she was going to write. She just had a desire and a love and a passion for writing and had never really allowed herself to follow that path. So after uh, a significant powerful NLP practice. She broke through the metaphor that she had been keeping inside of her of this brick wall. That she always bumped up against this metaphor of this brick wall. She broke through it and you can even see her whole body shift, her breathing changed, her skin tone, you know, her eyes were clearer and you, you, know, you can almost feel the room was all sort of feeling her shift. And uh, she wrote about it afterwards to me about the profound change. And since then, uh, I connected her with a woman who helps other women write books. She is now a published author. Mm -hmm. She has started a, um, um, poetry. She has a website. She's doing um, services for other writers and, and assisting others. And this, so this is something she's about maybe in her late 40s. Mm -hmm. So this is the profound kind of work that NLP can help a per person um, break through and really, like I say, live that dream that we've always wanted to dream. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. So how can we bring this home for parents whose children have cancer? What are the things that right now, the difficulties that they're going through, they have a child who's uh, been diagnosed with cancer, which can be so frightening. Um, they're, they're living a stressful life, uh, 
doctor's appointments, sometimes traveling, not being at home, having to stay at Ronald McDonald House or other places while their child is seeking treatment. Um, post During the treatment itself, it can be so difficult. Um, all of the things that they're watching their child go through, um, and then at the same time, then preparing or at home now, the, the child has done treatments, may or may not be in remission. There's that constant doctor's appointment scans. Um, there's a lot of stress in their lives. They're, they're experiencing trauma um, almost on a daily day basis, and they're watching this for their child who's experienced these traumas of all of these treatments. They could be surgeries and pokes and um, uh, scans and, and all of the obtrusive things that happen when you go through um, high-dose chemotherapy, radiation treatments for children. Um, and, and then trying to get back and have a normal life. What is it that can, can help? Um, what is it about NLP that would be beneficial for these, for these families and what they're going through? Well, in, an, in the brief terms, what we're going to cover today is the essence or the importance of breathing and a uh, unique twist on that from the NLP standpoint. Um, but as you say, the stress is ongoing, and so being able to maintain, build, nourish the self, their one self-care, and also the networking that goes or the support that goes with that, I think is uh, critically important for a sense of well-being because it is an ongoing challenge that you know it's not in the future; it's it's right now, it's today, it's every day, it's tomorrow. So you know finding a way to maintain your sense of well-being as you live through this. Um, and then creating, you know, opportunities to access memories that really do provide the kind of comfort or encouragement that I think is very, so critically important, uh, you know, during times like this that are so, so difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, really cherishing or embracing the things that are inspiring, comforting, things that make us feel good, kind of get us through the day. I think these are the things, and this is um, NLP and what we're doing very much is about the here and now. It is about the present moment, and it is about making the most of those present moments despite some very difficult uh, circumstances that uh, that obviously families with a child that uh, has this uh, disease is going through. Terrific. So what is the advice that you would give to parents? And what are the, could you share four things that, that they can take home? Um, what would you like to start with? I'll start, Laura. I'm, I would like to share uh, about breathing. And I, I know. Many of you, listen, the people listening, may be even thinking, oh my gosh, if one more person tells me just take three breaths or <laughs> just breathe or, you know, breathe and step away. And it, no, that's, um, while I think that in some situations, yeah, it's helpful um, to sort of stop yourself from maybe saying something inappropriate or whatever. It's so much more powerful than we realize. So what I want to introduce is the concept of using breathing as a leverage point. So again, when I said earlier, with NLP, we really are teaching, we're utilizing a set of step-by-step -step processes that impact our neurological and linguistic maps of the world. Um, so. What do I mean by a leverage point? Well, the metaphor I like to use is a set of dominoes that are all set up. And you know how you hit the first domino, and it's very difficult to stop the rest of them from all falling. Yeah. So we in NLP look at breathing as a really essential leverage point in terms of managing the current moment and what's happening in every single present moment, really. I mean, you can't get down every split second. Um, however, I would argue that you know, in some really intense situations, it almost breaks down to that level where a split second response can be the domino effect to what happens after. Okay. So, with that sort of concept in mind, um, 
when the breathing is not um, in working in our favor, it's going to impact the whole physiological state that we're in. And when I say physiological, what I mean is muscular. So whether there's tension in the muscles or the muscles are relaxed. The skeletal, in particular the spine, the spinal um, posture and, uh, is really, really key for how we, uh, what state we're in. You know, obviously a posture that's looking like this is much less resourceful than a posture that's upright. Right. And so the skeletal part of it, uh, <laughs> yeah. And the third part of this, and there could be others, I've just kind of brought it down to three, is the hormonal. So cortisol is the stress hormone, and there's so much research out there right now that is indicating that our breathing, uh, deep, deep breathing can, in fact, alter the uh, function, if you will, functionality of our hormones, and in particular the cortisol, which regulates our stress. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so that's the one thing I want to point out about breathing, is that that's the first domino in the whole very complex muscular, skeletal, and hormonal, uh, biochemical processes that we as human beings are operating within this body that we have. Mm -hmm. The second part of this, excuse me, <coughs> sorry about that. The second part of it is intention. As uh, when we look at breathing as an essential point of the um, state that we're in, the internal physiological state, Every state that we're in also supports an intention because um, within the state are certain behaviors. So if you think about um, a state of, for example, fear, which I'm guessing many parents who are in a situation dealing with kids with cancer would be in a state of fear. That's just one of many that I would categorize as being unresourceful in certain situations in a day-to-day -day basis. However, the intention that that fear state serves is to be all alert, to be protective, mm -hmm. to be watchful, and to be ready for um, just about every emergency that could occur. Right. Right? So in essence, our bodies are working beautifully to serve the intention of being protective, and you know, uh, ready to, to take care of any emergency. However, a fear state, as you can imagine, can be very exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, the breathing changes, the heart rates change, uh, there's tension in the muscle, we're ready to respond. Well, if we're doing that, you know, I won't say 24-7, it's pretty close. It's like we're doing that, yeah. You know, it's going to exhaust the adrenal glands. It's going to really break down a person's ability to even pay attention to other things which are so important, which is self-care mm -hmm. as well. You know, focus that's really narrow, and uh, we, we lose the ability to um, consider other aspects of what's going on that we could be taking advantage of to serve the same intention. And we get so stuck into that fear state. The brain has a pattern also of wanting to fall into this homeostasis. So it finds a state that it can maintain and it wants to just stay there as it takes more resources to get out of it. Okay, get it. Okay, so it takes a little bit of um, work for the brain and the body to move away from the state. Versus, if you look at being in a state of calm, even in a situation that could be quite um, challenging, if we go into that in a state of calm, knowing we still have the same resources available to be uh, attentive to what the needs of the other person are, to be ready to make any kind of actions and judgments very quickly to in an emergency, it's still going to serve the same intention. However, it's a far more resourceful state as we get to save more of our resources for when it's really that when it really matters. Mm -hmm. That that okay. makes sense. We serve the same intention, but the state we go into it is far more um, uh, 
more of a, um, a resting state. I liken it to, you know, being ready for anything. You know, being kind of ready to jump in, right? rather than being in it, waiting for it to come out of you. So it's a little bit different. It's the so I have the lifeguard on duty and the person who's in the water trying to save people. Okay. Oh, I like that metaphor. That is a beautiful metaphor, yes. And both have the skills to save the person. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep, great. So in this part one of my interview with Jackie and Ed, I really appreciated learning and properly understanding what NLP is all about and how we can use breathing as a leveraging point, going from simply breathing to setting an intention on the state of being we choose to be in, being a state of calm rather than in fear. Please join me next week for part two of my interview with Jackie and Ed, as Jackie goes into details of her four steps to shift from overwhelm to intentional, resourceful living. In the meantime, learn more about Jackie and Ed, please visit their website at holisticdirections.com. Before we end our show today, we have one last segment. Over the last few years, I have asked other cancer moms what advice they wish they'd known when their child was first diagnosed. I have compiled that information and will be sharing their advice each week. You can download the top 101 pieces of advice that I put together as a mini ebook at twomothersoneprayer.com. Today's advice comes from Jackie. She says, everything was a blur. I can't recall what was said or what her plan was. But some minor advice is wear good shoes, eat healthy, and get rest as it's a long journey, and take help from family and friends when offered. We only have one superhero in the family, and that's our child. Thanks, Jackie, for sharing that. If you have advice you've learned along the way that you wish someone had told you weeks, months, or years earlier, I invite you to fill out the contact form on our website, twomothersoneprayer.com, and I will be sharing your advice with our listeners on future shows. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to listen to the Hope, Strength, and Courage podcast. I look forward to sharing more experts and advice with you again next Wednesday. Please remember to take a minute to, dis to subscribe to the show. Thanks also need to go out to our Hope, Strength, and Courage production team which consists of my wonderful assistant, Tracy Ogilvie McDonald, Andrew Braun at Braun Audio and Audio Geek, music by Fizz Anthony, social media support by Marie Constantino, and graphic design by Amy Hosmer. To learn more about myself, Laura Lane, and to order my book, please visit lauralane.ca.